Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to John Ladley from Sonri. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. And this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to talk with people to help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by John Ladley, the principal at Sonri, and normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. John, hello and welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me on your podcast. It's uh, delighted to be here. Delighted to be here. Well, I'm excited that you're here. I've known you for, gosh, over 10 years now. Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't know yeah. that we've ever had that conversation of how you got started. I don't. I don't think we ever have. It's um, it's a checkered past. I hope this passes the censors. Um, we'll find out. I guess you know. Are there censors on podcasts? I don't know. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know where I. Where do you want to start? I I'm. Uh, um, Let's start you know. where you are currently. So you're the principal at Sonry. Sonry. Yeah, Sonry. Sonry. Son- yeah. Sonry. Yeah, and so it's, where, it's yeah. an Irish name, right? Sonry is the closest thing in Gaelic to the word data. Mm-hmm. So when I say Sonry solutions, it's data solutions in Gaelic, and that's because great granddad is from Tipperary in uh, Ireland, and um, I visit yeah. Ireland quite a bit. So, um, um, uh, uh, I, I I like Ireland, so I go there a lot, and then I find, and then I found out. I was actually Irish after I started going there, which was kind of cool to find out. Very um, cool, and it's spelled S O N R A I. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. and that, and yeah, and that's um, Gaelic as a language really has no alphabet, right. um, uh, um, so we 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 mess around with the words to try to get them close, um, and uh, um, uh, it's an astonishingly hard language to learn too. I've tried and given up. Um, but the sonary is actually it's not um the one thing to 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 for the listener is to, you know don't go looking in the wall street journal for a story about the yeah, i'm semi retired now i've been at this data business for a very very long time and um sonary is my llc that people write checks to you know and my accountant is happy that i have that or not um that's really the only reason it exists i quit building empires uh about Five years ago, six years ago, I uh, I stepped away from uh, full time ag- aggressive work, and and the work I do now in the data field is uh, selective, and it's designed, uh, and in the spirit of this podcast, what I'm doing now is designed to further the industry, to learn different things, to try different things, to look at really hard problems. Um, and uh, see what can be learned from that uh, before one day I wake up and just go, that's it, I'm done, right? <laughs> because, you, know, you know, and I climb into that thing behind me here and go off into the sunset, so. And so for those of you who cannot see currently, what's behind you? What's behind me, as he said, leaning a little bit, is a 1942 <laughs> Boeing Stearman biplane. It's two wings. As you can see, but it was a trainer in World War II. A lot of people will say two wings, World War I. No, there were still biplanes in the 1940s. And the primary trainer for the United States military for World War II was that particular airplane right there. They built 9,000 of them, give or take 
uh, mm -hmm. of them. And if you were a pilot in World War II, that's the first airplane you climbed into. And mine has been restored to its original out of the factory condition. Um, and and, and uh, this year is it's um, it's uh, 80, 82, 83 years old this year. So wow. it's an 83 year old airplane, but it's been wow. restored. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Yep. yep. Um, so how long have you been flying? We'll, we'll get into more of your bio, but how long have you been flying? Oh, yeah. Let's talk about the cool stuff first. Um, no, I, I, I always wanted to fly from a young lad and I yeah. couldn't do it because of some medical challenges and some life circumstances. But at some point when I was about 30 years old, I, I emptied out a, this is no lie, a big jar of money underneath my desk where I put my lunch money. Um, yeah. and I hadn't bought lunches for myself and I'd quit the golf team at work and I'd quit the bowling team at work and I saved up my money and I started to take flying lessons at the age of 30. That's when I started. So I've been flying for 37 years. It's, it's, I was not military, strictly civilian. Um, but, uh, um, I've always had this craving to get into these old classical machines. I mean, there's nothing digital at all right about this machine it is extremely crude it is the best technology 1935 had to offer um and to me it's a tremendous offset and escape from from the day job and mm -hmm. uh and i started right. to fly to get into one of these that's why i started to fly oh i love it yep. oh so Bearing back then a little bit to the data and your current role yeah, and yeah. what your profession and what you're doing. Uh, oh, um, oh, um, <laughs> so tell me, back so to the mundane. Me, oh, no, it's not mundane at all. No, I think you do <laughs> very cool things uh, and certainly cool things that we appreciate, the community appreciates. But uh, so, so tell me then what is, you know, you, you talked about focusing on problems and, uh -huh. and, and that kind of thing. So what is your uh, work week or work month look like now? Um, I, uh, I still work hard Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, um, Monday is research and writing day and Friday is don't bother me day. Um, okay. I, you know, um, we're recording this on a Friday, but that's because you guys are special and, uh -huh. and, and, and we data diversity, we all, we, we all go back a long way, right? Mm -hmm. um back to when it was some other organization i forget what the other name was with dataversity it was uh sure conferences yeah yeah wilshire yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um uh it was named after a sauce was it no that's worcestershire anyway um <laughs> yeah wilshire uh so mm -hmm. um uh um so that's what i do now i do a lot of mentoring i do a lot of coaching i work with a lot of executives now, uh, it's very common for me to speak to two or three CEOs a week. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, um, I work a lot with my peers in the industry right now. I'm right now, I'm um, because no one's told me it's okay to say it or not, I'm, I can't. But um, in the last six months, I've worked with four or five other people that have appeared on this podcast. And they are working with me or for me, or we're doing research together, or we're doing writing together based on research we've done together. Because um, we're trying to come up with a, a um, not a body of knowledge, but a, um, uh, uh, um, a sanity check of the profession in the last year or so. Um, so that's, that's what occupies my time. I have clients. Um, but, uh, you know, bringing a team of five or six people, I mean, my work has always been a little different. Um, uh, um, a lot of folks in the industry have, a lot of folks have written books like I have and things are, have been one or two person operators and that's what they like to do. I built consulting firms. I brought in four or five, six people on a team and we stayed for a year or two. We, we did, a, we did, we were a very tooth and claw competitor for the big five for when I mm -hmm. was uh, working in the two um, of my own company so that I uh, built or helped build. And, and uh, we were tooth and claw with the, that, that type of work. So, you know, lots of people training and salaries and benefits and running organizations and, and, and all of that. So my work has been a little bit uh, different. Um, 
Uh, and because of that, I bring different things to the table when there's a conversation to be had about what's working, what's not, what's practical, what's not practical and all of that. So, um, uh, um, so I'm kind of trying to, the culmination of that work for the last 25 years is really what can we learn from that and add to the body of experience that we have with the other people and come up with something that works moving forward. And that's really what we're working on now. Nice. I like it. And so when you say um, the profession, are, yeah. are you talking about all data practitioners or a specific yeah. subset of that? No, I'm talking about uh, what we, 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 we refer to each other as data people. All right. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's an enterprise data world conference every year, as you well know, there's the DGIQ conferences now. Um, there's uh, uh, other organizations that also have similar themed things. It's, it's no, you know, I can say TDWI, you won't edit it out, I don't think, or anything like that. Um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of out there. And, and, and that encompasses, to me, the profession encompasses everything now from strategic planning, of saying you want to be a digital organization or a data-driven organization. Mm -hmm. um, and through that leadership structure, which would then of course include chief data officers and the board of directors and CXOs, things like that. Uh, and then on down through this, the stack of the, um, uh, uh, the, the architecture, the oversight, the business intelligence part, the data quality part. Now, We've thrown in AI and machine learning, uh, sprinkling that in now, and uh, the uh, um, all the way through things like now the data mesh and data fabric and all the stuff that's related to that. That's all DBAs, data administrators, database administrators, data analysts. That's all our uh, data modelers. That's all our data people. That's that's the universe that I believe I work in. I like it. All right. Well, let's talk about then how you got there. So tell oh. me, John, <laughs> was this, what was the, what was the dream? Like, so say you were six years old. <laughs> what, what was the dream? What did you grow up? Did you say, I'm going to grow up and I'm be an astronaut. <laughs> astronaut? I want to be an astronaut. Nice. I want to be an astronaut. That yeah. was, that was the absolute gosh, honest truth. I was yeah. going to be mm -hmm. an astronaut and, and my grandfather uh, sent self-addressed stand envelopes. I don't think you're old enough to remember doing that, but that's how that's how we Googled in 1963. Mm -hmm. Is you sent a self-addressed stamped envelope to NASA, and they stuffed this envelope full of everything you asked for and mailed it back to you. So you said, "I'd like to learn everything there is about the Mercury and the Gemini astronauts, and what can I learn? I'm a young man, and and all this." And my grandfather would would do that. And, um, and I guess that triggered kind of a data research thing for me at a very, very young age. Mm -hmm. um, and we would sit there and we would watch the, we would look at the material that NASA had sent my grandfather and I, and we would watch the Gemini mission or the uh, Mercury mission or the early Apollo missions. And, mm -hmm. and we would follow the mission because we would have had, we would, they sent us the mission profile and things like, cause it's all public domain. Right. And, 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 um, uh, and that's why I wanted to be an astronaut. And then I found out I, I, um, I'm blind in one eye and they didn't want monocular astronauts, you know, <laughs> um, I, I had a, a touch of, uh, asthma and they didn't want anyone with an inhaler orbiting the earth. So <laughs> excuse me, Houston, right. I can't do that. Um, uh, couldn't do that. So, mm -hmm. um, I ended up just going to college and, coming out with a degree in accounting and a degree in economics and a minor in philosophy and a minor in music. And, yeah. um, and, uh, that's a, that's a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, I, well, I, put myself through, yeah. I put myself through school, um, back at, again, um, I hope you don't get tired of this because when you talk to someone my age, Shannon, you're going to get all this back in the day conversations, which could get just stupefying at some point in time. Right. But, um, when I went to liberal arts college, it was a flat fee and you got X number of credit hours every semester. And I put myself through school. I scraped and saved and worked and, and I got 19 credit hours a semester and for, for all eight 
semesters, I took 19 credit hours. Um, and then in the summertime, um, towards the end of my college, the pit, I was some from Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh economy, the steel industry collapsed in the late seventies. Right. So I couldn't get a summer job. Um, so I went to community college in the summertime and I got another nine, 12, 15 credit hours at community college. So, um, I ended up with two majors and two minors and, um, and they couldn't put that on a diploma. They didn't know how to, but that's what I came out of it with. So, you know, then I go into just working and, you know, everyone, and my first job had nothing to do with that. My first job was a disc jockey because I got yeah. involved with the school radio station. And that's probably honest, just between you and I, let's not tell anyone else this. That's the most fun I've ever had getting paid for anything. And if I could do it again, I'd probably do it again in a heartbeat. But um, uh, but I made a dollar and a quarter an hour and they got they, they were giving me a whole eight hours a week. So do the math. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't couldn't put gas in the car. Anyway, I ended up longer. It's a long story. Don't have time for it. I ended up doing I.T. stuff, mostly because a friend called me and said, John, my company needs computer programmers. If you can spell IBM, we'll hire you. And I said, I have no desire to be a programmer. And my friend said, but you get $12,000 a year. And I went, did you just say $1,000 a month? And she said, yes, $1,000 a month. Well, in 1979, that's a princely sum. And I said, where do I sign up? And that is no lie how I got into IT. All right. Wow. Um, and then for the next 10 years, give or take, I was a developer and a program manager, low-level coder. I've coded. Um, I've coded in Assembler and PL1 and Fortran and COBOL and all of that. Now, you know, I learned stuff that I learned that there was a mystery out there. There was a mysterious force we weren't addressing in applications development that was messing everything up. And eventually I figured out it was data. And at some point I found myself as a, um, uh, in a small company in St. Louis, where it was a defense contractor and they collected data, analyzed data and sold the results of their data back to the appropriate defense agencies, Army, Navy, Air Force, et cetera. So in the late 80s, I worked for a company that monetized data. Now wow. you're in this business. You know, you've heard that term in the last five years. Yeah. 1989, I was the CIO of an organization that monetized data. And at that point, without knowing it, I became a data person without knowing it and I uh, and we had all the problems everyone has discovered in the last 10 15 years we had data quality issues we had no consistent models we didn't know what a data model was but we didn't have any right and so we we invented everything from from scratch we we had to do everything uh there was nothing we could use and we created a big wave bunch of people that um and I guess the privilege or of, of age or something is in 1989, uh, our little business, our beautiful company, we're all having fun. We went out of business because peace broke out. The Berlin Wall came down. A mm -hmm. big historical event affected my career. I, you know, like many human beings, the, the wave of history pushed me in a different direction. So I had to go into the big five to make a living. And in the big five, I learned how the consulting drill and all of that kind of stuff. And I ended up being the data person in the big five. And then I ended up being in Meta Group, which became Gartner Group. So I was the industry analyst type in that industry. And then I went off on my own. At least 25 years, I've been self-unemployed, I tell people. Um, uh, and uh, But in that data. But it was about in the late 80s when I became a full-time data person, which was a lot sooner than a lot of other people in our industry. But we, but I can't claim I invented it because we were clueless. We didn't know what we were doing. We were just meeting our customers' demands as the best we could, and and we right. we didn't put a label on it, you know. 
we just we just did our jobs. We just showed up and did our jobs, right? So, I mean, I wasn't a guru or anything. I just people, my in the big five, the partners began to ask me to speak and do speeches at executive breakfasts and stuff because I'd done all this stuff. And I and to me, it was like falling out of bed. But to everyone else, it was like, oh my gosh, this is this is this is nuts. This is this is the future. So, so here I am, you know, uh, you know, unaccustomed as I was to public speaking. I, <laughs> I go, hard to I mean, imagine I, now <laughs> well you know luckily the dj thing really helped i you know because sure. i was really a heads down leave me alone programmer guy i mean look, look as long as the checks were clearing i mean i was in there at eight o'clock and at 501 when the whistle blew and i actually did work somewhere where we did have a whistle that blew and at 501 i was headed out to the parking lot I did, you were there was no hard charging entrepreneurial executive here i was just a coder guy but this data stuff it, you know and again we and we we intimated on us at the beginning this is society changing this is an anthropological um wave for humanity this data business which is why i'm still in it it's exciting it's exciting but um we had no idea back then uh, other than to me this was really cool it was really different and i wanted to run it down and um and then um, the only other thing career-wise really is I was always in the wrong doorway at the right time when someone said, um, John, we have uh, a terabyte of data to store and we only have 200 gig to do with it. How do we go about doing that? I mean, those are the kind of problems that I was in the right room to deal with. So, you know, we wrote algorithms to do data compression in 1989, which, which disappeared into the history, we, you know, the company went under and everything disappeared, but we were doing stuff like that way before anyone else was doing, doing stuff like that. Anyway, that's a nutshell, a lot of stories along the way. I, huh? um, I will stop here and, um, well, let me, I would say, you know, that you got into data even earlier. I mean, with a degree in accounting. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, accounting, you know, accounting, though, from the debit and credit and the financial um, management side mm -hmm. um, in economics. But we never worried about whether the data was accurate or not when I was an accountant. I mean, one of my first corporate jobs was a plant accountant. Mm -hmm. um, I used my programming skills one week a month to uh, to hard code COBOL programs to do adjusting entries. Um <laughs> I didn't say I wrote good code, but we we would change hard we would we would change hard coded routines to to adjust the books and stuff like that. But um, but the data part this is an interesting thing for the current generation to understand. If this is the way you want your podcast to go, this is something I I, I like to put out there. Um, when in nineteen eighty five, eighty six, eighty seven, um whenever I was in my earlier corporate jobs or even the early 80s, we didn't quibble about data accuracy or data quality because the accountants had controls in place and we had data control clerks in every department. And if we did a batch of data and that batch of data, the control numbers didn't add out, um, my beeper went off. Yes, a beeper in the middle of the night, a pager. Google it, young people. My pager would go off in the middle of the night and I would be at work at three in the morning till we found that data problem and we fixed it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, we didn't have, we didn't have to, the way we worry about data now, we didn't have to worry about it. And so we had that issue, but we also weren't using data mm -hmm. the way we use data now, all right? Which got us into the next, what I call the big ugly lie of the big lie has nothing to do with the last election, by the way. It has to do with the fact that everyone still believes I can take all of our transactional data and drop it into some someplace, warehouse, mart, lake, lake house, outhouse, I don't care. And 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 easily, easily get what I want to out of that data. And that the fact is we knew that in 1980, it doesn't work. It does not work. It, it'll never work. Uh, data quality makes it even worse. But the fact is it's just the context of operational data 
makes what we want to do with data now almost impossible. That's why I find AI scary. Okay, we think we have something that we can do AI with, and I don't think we have it. So, um, uh, and that, I'm sorry, I went on a soapbox there. I'll get off of it now. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launch pad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Oh, no, the soapbox is good. It's very, very good. Um, so, but, you know, and, and along that line, so tell me what has been your biggest lesson so far in your career? Uh, I've had several epiphanies. Um, I mean, because at one point, um, so I can share a, a story here. I was, um, when I left the big five, I got the job as the senior director or VP of data at a blue cross company. And we had to build what became known as like one of the first big, large scale data warehouses. Um, this is the early nineties. And I, I, I remember going to my boss asking for two terabytes of storage and he almost fired me on the spot. And he, <laughs> he said, nobody on God's earth will ever in the history of everything till, till the sun goes Nova need two terabytes of data. <laughs> and he said, Wrong by US. the way, <laughs> how, how much money do they want? I said, IBM wants $10 million for two, a two terabyte server. And he was like, ah, and his head, you know, and running around in circles and smoke coming out of his ears. Like, I guess I'm not going to get my two terabytes of storage anyway. Um, so I was in this, um, healthcare company, and I had the playbook for data with me, and that was do a data model, agree on the definitions, draw all this stuff, and I went up to a blank whiteboard, and I brought everyone in on a Saturday morning, because we were busy, and said, let's do a data model, like Mickey and Judy, let's do a show, right, and um, and I got thrown out of, you know, but just about got thrown out of town, tarred and feathered. Um, uh, I learned really quick that an awful lot of stuff we had been taught was good in theory, but had not had any contact with reality yet. What I, my first epiphany was a lot of what we do in, and by the way, I'm not gonna, this is not just in data for a short time because I was a developer, I got involved with software engineering and uh, uh, development standards. And the, the I, was, I was involved with a very early capability maturity model out of you know Carnegie Mellon. I was part of that process many, many years ago in software engineering tools, things like that. And I learned from that one too. And I learned from the client server bit and the object oriented bit and all this kind of stuff. We get these great ideas in this world. And, and uh, my first epiphany was most of the great theories um, don't survive first contact with reality. Um, so I became, my first epiphany was in the <clears throat> um, mid nineties was be very practical. And I guess if I have a trademark, if I have a, a brand characterization, that's me is practical. All right. Um, that was my first big epiphany in the industry. The second one um, was um, uh, coming out of my meta group slash Gartner group days and going into my own work and uh, still being hung up on installing tools and stuff. The second big epiphany was a lot of vendors really don't care about the success of their technology. They just want to make money and get acquired. Um, and and I, that was sad. That was sad. Now, we're in a different era now. And I think to an extent that's changed. But, you know, during the dot-com boom, things, things were pretty wild west. And that was my second epiphany, which was um, uh, do your due diligence. Do your due diligence. Um, the third epiphany has been pretty recent. I would call that, um, and the final one here is in the last couple of years, um, we've been banging away, doing things a certain way. Just look at all the presentations at EDW for the last 10 years. Try to sum them up into some certain processes. You'll see some distinct patterns, right? 
Um, a lot of those patterns, a lot of those protocols that people have tried to use aren't working. They sound like they should work. They've worked once or twice. Uh, our good friend Tom Redman calls them points of light, right? Um, uh, but on the whole, we're finding out that a lot of what we've been doing um, is not delivering on the promises we've made. It works, all right? I'm not, I'm not dis dismaying our industry. It works. We're on the right track. Data is super important. You need data people to understand that. But a lot of what we have done hasn't really delivered the mail. So my third epiphany is how I've been doing the work I'm doing now, which is what does work? And is there something new we need to do? And do we have to reskill our profession? Uh, and and that's my third epiphany, really. Those, those are the three bellwether things in the last 35 years for me. Mm. That's fantastic. And and, and it, uh, it it definitely yeah, it sets up the, your soapbox. <laughs> and where uh, you, yeah. Where, yeah. Well, you know, I, I was um, I was raised in an uh, what I would call an industrial middle class, lower middle class house where everyone worked hard hourly. Everyone was in a union in the family except me. I was the first person in. No, I was the second person in the four generations since the immigration in the mid 19th century, my family to go to college. So we're talking 50, 60 offspring and all their offsprings and stuff. And there was only two of us that completed college and I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, and, and, uh, but what I came out of uh, uh, here was a fierce, probably early on in my, when I was less mature, uh, almost an unrealistic and frankly annoying sense of justice um here um uh, uh tempered now by you know the fact that the, <laughs> the world's not perfect and it's the world's just by definition going to aggravate you and you might as well just laugh at it so um uh but i i do find along the way that i i do lean in on this stuff because i i just don't like to see people people waste their time does that make yeah. sense Oh, gosh, you see, yes. you know, mm -hmm. you see someone appointed to do a data governance program or a data architect or something, and they bust their tail for two years and do this and do that. And they follow all the protocols we've given them over the last 20, 30 years. And at the end of it, nobody looks at it. Everyone ignores it. And then someone else comes along in two years and does the exact same thing. And you see it again and again and again. And to me, I just, I, it, it gets me viscerally, you know? It's someone's wasted their time. Life is precious. You know, if we're going to waste that much time, I think we all just go fishing. Okay. And just to, just tell corporate America to stuff it. All right. But there's a job that needs to be done and we've got to figure out how to do that job. And that's what yeah. I'm working on my third book right now. My third book is, is starting to form and it's, it's going to be around that theme that, We've got to learn how to do better. And by the way, it's not just the data folks. It's also our peers in the business and our constituents in and out of the companies and organizations we work with. All of humanity has to up its game around data. We are, we are in a, an era here where data is much more profoundly affecting our life than we ever imagined it would. And it's no longer just a cool thing uh, and um, a way to make money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're, uh, we are infantile in this world as to what the accumulation of our activity, which is data. Data represents human activity now. It documents human activity real time, 24 by 7, 365. And we don't know how to manage that, deal with it, handle it, or anything. I think our generation, our data people, we're the first generation to actually confront this and go, ooh, ooh, this is hard. <laughs> you know, this is not easy. 
you know, and, and you know, but we go to a talk and say, well, the vendor says, all you got to do is buy this tool and do this thing and get some buy-in. And, and then the heavens open and there's Skittles and unicorns flying all over the place. And, and, and that's just all hoo-ha. Okay. It, you know, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that we're, um, I don't know how many other things in human endeavors have every, every people started optimistic. Hey, you and I were supposed to be having anti-gravity pants right now. Right. And we were supposed to be the Jetsons, right. We were supposed to just fly to school and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and every push a button. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, we were going to supposed to have, when I was a, a kid, uh, my grandfather said, it's amazing that someday I'll take a pill and it'll give me all the nutrition I need for the day. You know, uh, I'm going to eat hyper processed food and I will, I will not need to eat anything during the day. And we, and, and we were going to be on Mars by now. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of that. Time. We, people oversell everything and we've oversold data. Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, that's part of what's forming this conversation here and where I am, I am where I am. I like it. So I'm still waiting for a teleportation, by the way. Uh, that's... Oh, hey, the beaming thing, sign me up day one. Right. Um, That would be <laughs> so nice. I don't know. Um, You were at um our event in Washington, D.C., right, in December? You were there. Mm -hmm. I saw mm -hmm. you there. Yeah. I mean, I had the the going home nightmare. Um. Mm -hmm was at the airport plenty of time and didn't get home till nine hours later yeah, yeah. on a, on a one hour flight. <laughs> oh gosh. So, oh. So, sign me up, Scotty. I'm right. Beanie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm all for it. yeah. Yep. All right. General with such a distinguished career in data, yeah. what is your definition of data and how do you, so what's your definition of data? uh what's changing all right i mean you know uh in the 70s or 80s data were uh, was uh row and column representations of operational events right and then data became uh rows and columns and and um uh, and also collections of bits and bytes without structure like a document um, that represent uh, events and contracts and agreements, um, and it expanded. And then we got into this, there's data, and then there's information, and then there's knowledge. And we, we, we rode that bus for a while. And I think that's malarkey, by the way. That's total malarkey now. Okay. Um, uh, uh, um, I mean, I've had CFOs lean across the table and bang on a table and say, John, I don't want to hear about a data strategy. I don't need data. I need information. And and I I said to one, I said, well, here's the problem in this 20th century. And and by the way, before I go on in the story, the CEO had given me full carte blanche to be candid with his team. Okay. So, so you all don't think I'm some kind of annoying person. All right. I, I might be an annoying person. I just don't want you to think it. But so, and I looked at the CFO and I said, here's the problem with that. If I gave you all the information you think you need, you don't know what to do with it. You can't handle the truth. Okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, and I said, I want to hire Harry Potter. Harry Potter's going to come in and go, twink, boom. There it is. Lean your head against the terminal. Everything sucks into your mind. What's different tomorrow? What do you improve tomorrow? Oh, well, I got to think about it. No, no, then you, then you, then you haven't thought it through, right? They're like, no, I haven't. I go, yeah. I said, forget data and information. Now I'm on this third thing. What's data? Data is, as I intimated earlier, it is the record of our human existence in all of its forms. But that means it comes with an enormous amount of baggage. You know, what are the ethics? Who can see my data? I'm sorry, Facebook, so I can have an enhanced user experience? Forget that now. I want to sell it. I don't want, I mean, 
the minute I can sell my data to Facebook for 80 bucks a year is when I sign up for that and and I drop all my apps on 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 this kind of thing. I mean, we are, you know, so data is really to me, it's the recording of our human existence in all the shapes, sizes, forms, and permutations. So that's data now. Yeah, indeed. So tell me, do you see the importance, you know, as the definition is changing, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Well, I certainly see data being more important, but I also see data becoming more and more uh, worked into the everyday language of business. So to be maybe scarily prescient, I see the data jobs, the data profession, I see shrinking. Hmm. All right. Um, A, because the promises haven't been met and corporate America has no mercy with that. All right. Let's just be kind. Let's be candid. You only get so many failures and then they go something else. All right. Um, Second is data is so ubiquitous that eventually, and this is starting to happen, you're seeing this a lot of places, that that um, uh, the whole thing of data mesh, and data fabric, and having business empowered business people learning to be that product manager out on the mesh or the fabric or whatever you know uh, syntax you want to use or something like that. Those, you know, we're not saying, hey, want a data architect to be a data mesh product manager. No, it's like, oh, you're in marketing. You understand marketing. I want you to represent the marketing data, right? And the AI and the metadata and the technology are taking care of all that nuts and bolts stuff. So I see our profession shrinking. I see the need to be smarter about data and the need to be data aware and the need to educate more people about it and at the end of the day i see the need for data skill sets improve you know expanding exponentially but i don't know i don't think that means our profession grows exponentially because this is just like anything else everything starts out specialized and then it commoditizes and there is no universal rule that says the data business is going to be any different than taking care of your car making food, electrical. I mean, in 1920, if you wanted to, to add a, an outlet to your house, you had to call an electrician because nobody understood alternating current. You had to get somebody That's else or, or you burned your house down. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Now you go to Home Depot and there's a little box and it's got a package and then says, and then there's a little QR code and you do look at the YouTube video and, and you do it, right? It's mm-hmm. commoditized, right? Mm-hmm. Data's not immune from that. Oh, we must have a normalized database. Ah, the AI will do it. Forget it, All right? The AI is going to do it. I mean, I, I asked ChatGPT two years ago when it was first starting to rumble, I asked ChatGPT to do a data model for a specific client of mine. And I had their data model in front of me and it matched about 90%. Mm-hmm. And it did it in 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so no, it's gonna change a lot. It's it's gonna change a lot. But it's it's not a bad change. It's not a it's an evolution. It, it's it's we're gonna get a handle on it. I think the skills we have, the fact mm-hmm. that our data profession gets it and got it a lot before other people puts us ahead. We have an obligation to, to uh, discern what is gobbledygook to our customers and don't don't in, make them endure that. You know, um, I've had uh, on a client meeting, I had uh, uh, someone uh, all of a sudden thought they had the ear of the CEO and they started talking about a very complicated snowflake schema that they were working on. And the CEO was like, excuse me, how did we get here, right? Um, I think if we learn to, to talk right to leadership and, and be more a part of the business and we lose some of the hubris we have accumulated and we have on there, I think we are in the driver's seat. But I don't think our profession is going to grow exponentially. It's going to get absorbed. Okay, it's going to get absorbed into the fabric of the organizations. That might be 20 years from now, 30 years, but that's, 
Uh, I mean, you know, um, take finance. Okay. Yeah. There's this, there's the financial people. They have the controls. They make sure everything adds up. They make sure that the financial picture represents the organization legally, but, there isn't anybody in a business leadership thing that doesn't know what a debit and credit is, doesn't know what a budget is, doesn't know what accrual is or not accrual. If you don't know those things, you don't get your job, right? So I think that's where we're headed. I don't know. What do you think? Can I interview the interviewer? No. <laughs> You know, I, I, I have I, an I, interview, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I really do think I, I don't know if anyone else has said that to you when you've asked them that question, but I think yeah. the growth, the growth of data skills is exponential. The growth of our profession is 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 uh, not so much, not so much the bottom line. It. Would you what advice then would you give to people looking to get into a career in data? Well, I was thinking that, that there was a that that question might come up and I actually in a um, flash of uncharacteristic organization um, wrote a few things down <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I actually do a slide on this for a lot of my my talks now um, uh, Tom Redman and I just did an article and it's in the data diversity um, content right now uh it's about two months ago now and it's things aren't working as well as we want them to what can we do about it and we stepped back uh tom and i threw everything out uh we did a thought experiment right can you do this philosophically or logically you can take a premise and you can say well what if my premise is wrong let me posit the incorrect premises or the premise that's different and we posited that, and we used that the way to run down all kinds of uh, scenarios that happen in our industry. And what we came up with was some common things that we see, whether you accept the premise that data management works or you accept a premise, which is not true, but you're thinking this stuff doesn't work. We got to try something entirely different. The one thing that came up a lot was that there are innate skills required in any human endeavor to make that endeavor work. And those innate skills are missing in data folks. Now, Tom's new book about people and data is wonderful. Um, and he touches on this. But just to, to recap, because this is some work him and I have been doing for uh, a couple of years, okay? Um, first of all, our profession needs to learn how to communicate better, okay? I would give on average, every team I've worked with that are just pure data people who are running the data governance program or setting up data management or working on it, I would give them at best a B minus in communication skills, right? Um, where we've been successful is there's been that business sponsor come in and they've done the communication, okay? Um, I would say there's essential business skills missing. When you do a meeting, you take minutes and you send the meetings out, you send the minutes out. Um, uh, I do a lot of firefighting. I do a lot of coming in when things have gone off the rails right now. That's kind of most, most of my work is we've tried this four times, John. What, what are we doing wrong? Um, and, and the one thing I go in, I go, well, let me see the minutes. Let me see the notes, the meetings. Oh, what, let me see the ebb and flow of this. Oh, there aren't any minutes. Oh, are you kidding me? All right. Learn how to be a business person. Okay. Um, oh, we don't have a tool to record the workflow. Oh, well, too bad. Suck it up, buttercup, put it in a spreadsheet. Okay. Um, uh, learn logic. Um, Gannon, did you ever take a symbolic logic or philosophy or logic or the math of logic in school? Yeah. That's a fun course. I've never talked to anyone who didn't like that course. Oh, yeah. Oh. I, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I hear a lot of people express things as fact. In, in an architecture or something um, that if you would mathematically reduce their argument, it's not a valid argument, right? Um, it's a lot like listening to the heavily tilted news media, whether it's right or left in our world right now, the divisive news media it is the fact that you will hear them say something and you go, wait a second, I studied logic and what they just said 
they would get a C or a D on their logic test, okay? So uh, that's the next thing. And the last thing is just be, learn, to, learn to talk about your business or your organization. Don't sit back there on your ivory tower and saying, well, you obviously don't understand, but I have the magic keys to the kingdom. And if you just do what I'm going to tell you to do, it will all work out well, because you don't have the right context there. Okay, you're separating yourself from your peers. You're separating yourself from the practical. And the result you're going to get is a textbook, generic, philosophically correct result that may not work. And that, that's a, that, so those are things I actually tell everybody all the time. Great advice. I try. Very good advice. I try. John, it has been such a pleasure. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask how people would get in touch with you if they wanted to reach out. Um, I have a website. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, after a lot of research and uh, investment in marketing, uh, smart people, people smarter than me, we decided to call it johnlanley.com. There you go. I have a website called johnlanley.com, so it's not hard to find. It's got some good content on it. It's not up to date, but that's a way to get a hold of me. You can also email me at john at ladley.biz. Um, I'm no longer on Twitter. I don't do Instagram. Um, uh, also LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. So that's mm -hmm. the, uh, the ways. Or just go down to an airport in the St. Louis area and hang out around. I'll show up sooner or later in that blue and yellow beastie that I fly. So oh, I love it. Well, John, thank you so much. And we'll get those links posted to the podcast site as well. So sure. Have sure. Access to that. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. Thank you, Shannon. And, uh, and thank you, Dataversity. You guys are awesome. And uh, we've had a good 20, 25 year run since we'll mm -hmm. share and I'm hoping for many, many years of it. Likewise. All right. Oh, well, and to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest podcast and in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank <music> you.